Here is Sarah Grant, and she is going to tell you about the evolution of our language. <laughs> kind of a broad uh, subject there. I'm not daring to do all of it, don't worry. Um, my name's Sarah Grant. I have been uh, mostly a fiction writer most of my life. I've been getting more into copywriting, editing, proofreading in the last several years as kind of a way to make a living doing something that I love as opposed to doing something that I hate, like the only tiny little bit of programming that I've ever learned. So I, I don't have a prejudice against programming. It's just the stuff that I have done is not my favorite. Um, I currently work for an organization in Seattle called Geek Girl Con. Uh, we celebrate and honor, honor the legacy of women um, in science and technology, comics, arts, and literature, and game play and game design. We foster community within and continued growth of women in geek culture through the events that we throw, including our convention coming up in October. You can let me know afterwards if you have any questions. I'd love to talk to anybody who wants to know about it. So at the moment, I'm currently a, a barista at a little geek-inspired coffee house in Seattle. So if anybody uh, has copy editing or proofreading jobs, I'm here. And uh, that's me right there. You can get a hold of me at either, uh, either email address. So as I said, this is a pretty broad topic uh, that I'm going to tackle. When I sat down to research this and write my presentation, it took me quite a while to get started because the English language is so immense and so complicated and very confusing, as any non-native English speaker can tell you. How can I possibly take the evolution of the English language from spoken to written to text speak in 20 minutes? How can anyone pack that much information into a 20-minute presentation? Simple, nobody can. For instance, let me give you a very brief history of my favorite book, the Oxford English Dictionary. When the members of the Philological Society of London decided in 1857 that existing English language dictionaries were incompetent and deficient and called for a complete re-examination of the language from Anglo-Saxon times onward, they knew they were embarking on an ambitious project. However, even they, did, even they didn't realize the full extent of the work that they initiated or how long it would take to achieve the final result. The new dictionary was planned as a four-volume, 6,400-page work that would include all English language vocabulary from the early Middle English period, 1150 AD, onward, plus some earlier words if they had con continued to be used into Middle English. It was estimated the project would be finished in approximately 10 years. Five years, exactly. Five years down the road when the organizers had only reached as far as the word ant, A-N-T, they realized it was time to reconsider their schedule. In April 1928, the last volume was published. Instead of 6,400 pages in four volumes, the dictionary published under the imposing name A New English Dictionary on Historical Principles contained over 400,000 words, words and phrases in 10 volumes. According to Wikipedia, the, uh, as of November 2005, there are 59 million words listed in the OED, spanning 22,000 pages. It would take a single person 120 years to type all that out and 60 years to proofread. I'm game if anybody needs that. So I initially thought I'd pick a word that's very common in text speak and find its historical entry into the OED and follow the etymology of that word up to where it's used today. I decided to buy myself a subscription to the Oxford English Dictionary online, strictly for research purposes, of course, not for the sheer enjoyment of being able to have all that etymology at my fingertips. I found a website also called NetLingo, which has a list of common text speak words. There are over 2,000 possibilities on this page alone, and there are certainly many more than those 2,000. I discovered that on that site, there's a difference between text speak and acronyms, which seems pretty obvious. Text speak consider, consists of words which are shortened or abbreviated for the ease of typing, you know, with your thumbs, whereas acronyms use the first letter of each word to form a new word, like NASA or OED. Actually, no, that'd be more of an acronym. Yeah, that's right. Um, though, spelled T-H-O, that's up there. Short for T-H-O-U-G-H is one text speak I've used myself, and I actually do quite a lot. I've also used Gratz, G-R-A-T-Z, which is short for congratulations. Uh, Blackberry is short for Blackberry phone, B-L-K-B-R-Y, although I usually refer to mine as a crackberry when I had it. Um, 
Some text speak replaces the word with another entirely or makes the original shortened word into a longer one. Apparently book means cool now, so that works for me as well as a bibliophile. And um, text speak for by is buh by, which is a little bit longer than, you know. Uh, some of my favorite acrony acronyms are up here that I got off that page as well. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, way over there. I like that one a lot. Acorn is a completely obsessively complete nut. That's what that stands for, and I really like that one a lot. And uh, my favorite is good seeing you, just don't wear your monkey hat. That's that one right there. I don't know what that means, and I think that means I'm really not cool and hip to the actual lingo, which is fine. So I looked at my abstract again, and inspiration finally struck. I looked up the word orientated on the OED online as I picked on that word as being just plain wrong in my abstract. I've heard people say that they'd been orientated after they'd been to an orientation. Sounds kind of logical, I guess. Kind of like conversated after you've been in a conversation, which by the way is not in the OED, thank goodness. I can sort of understand where it comes from. Like I said, it kind of is logical, but it still makes my spine tingle in a very bad way every time I hear it. To my horror, I discovered orientated is a word. There it is. According to its entry in the OED, orientated was first used in Harper's Magazine in 1867 as having a definite or specified orientation. Makes sense. Yeah, I, it just goes against everything that I learned about English growing up through school, and it just drives me crazy. But orientated also exists with the same general definitions on the free dictionary online, Merriam-Webster, and in dictionary.com. I posted this horror on my Facebook status, stating that the foundations of my world had been shaken. I have quite a few friends who are grammar nerds, um, amateur and professional writers, and a couple of publishers and editors. Responses ranged from, oh my, to kill self, to no, this is not sanity. That last one was from my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Lesson Jack, so I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> then again, the OED says that orientated is a word, so I guess I have to go with that, right? The English language really is very, very fluid, which I've always known, but it's kind of come home to me as I've been doing this presentation. Native English speakers learned what we were told were the rules about words, spelling, grammar, and punctuation. As we move through our lives, though, the rules seem to be changing. How's that possible? How can we tell what's correct and what's not correct and what's changing and could be correct next week? There's really no way. Is there any such thing as an unchanging rule in the English language? And if there isn't, shouldn't there be? I follow the rules. I don't know if you could tell. Um, will using an apostrophe S eventually make a word plural? <laughs> or will that always be wrong? Will interchanging there, there, and there become common usage? How will we, will we start seeing the letter U in places of other than texting when the writer means you, Y-O-U. Do we need to start a secret organization of ninja grammarians to correct people's <laughs> usage? My friend Tori thinks this is exactly what we need. We are the charter members. She got these little stickers <laughs> made online and we put them on posters and such around in Seattle. It's hilarious and yet very, very sad that we have to do that. <laughs> anyway, until I'm convinced otherwise. I am currently taking the Oxford English Dictionary at its word, though I'm not going to use orientated. I just can't. <laughs> I'm also following grammar and punctuation rules as written in the 16th edition of the, Ox the Chicago Manual of Style. It provides me and hopefully millions of other people with a sense of security and some comfort, in my case, to go with rules, when I can ask a question and have something to which I can point as an authoritative answer. I recently took that position as a copywriter for Geek Girl Con, and I splurged a couple months ago and bought myself a hardback copy of the 16th edition of the Chicago Manual of Style. I use it several times just in the last week doing stuff for them, so it's really very handy. It's right next to my computer at home. I also have an online subscription to that one, which is very useful when I'm not at home. 
if I had a physical copy of the Oxford English Dictionary, I'd probably have to get a fireproof safe to put in my bedroom, um, partially because it's really expensive for the whole thing, but also because I just have that much reverence for it. I would need to unlock it and look at it and hear the choir sing and <laughs> shut it and lock it back up again. So I'm looking for more copywriting and copy editing jobs as well, and some of the positions advertised use a different authority for writing and grammar rules, the Associated Press Style Guide. I'm just beginning to learn some of the differences between the rules of the Chicago Manual of Style and the AP Style Guide. If I have to learn another set of rules on top of these professional sources, my mind might actually melt. I really don't want to do that. So now we're all wondering what my little rant with its examples has had to do with anything relevant. Here it is. Nothing about the English language other than, or any other spoken language in human history is static. Words, spellings, usage, and even rules will continue to change as the English-speaking world continues. In several hundred years, my ideas of correct English will likely be as foreign to English speakers then as the rules of Middle English are foreign to me now. The only logical conclusion is to try and let English in all of its derivations and deviations flow around me. Either that or I need to get a job as an editor with the Chicago Manual of Style. That's it. Okay, who has questions? Questions? Sorry, there raise those here. hands again. Sorry, I didn't see them. I hope you won't be too upset when I tell you that the OED is available free to certain public library cardholders. I do know that, and I found out about it after I'd bought my subscription. But I only bought it for a month, so I'm probably going to have to cut it off. Uh, I have to say I share your reference. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I would like to point out, in the uh, interest of extreme pedantry, that uh, um, it, it's, it's only actually considered uh, an acronym if it's pronounceable, like NASA. Otherwise, it's an initialism, like GMO. Ah, thank you very much. I appreciate the knowledge. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm excellent taking criticism and being told I'm wrong or adding more knowledge to my head. I'm good with that. I disagree with that. <laughs> good luck. Good luck. Looks like Troy is running up the stairs. There's actually another comment more than anything, which is it was kind of on the issue of um, this orientated thing. It's actually mm -hmm. had this happen to me. Okay. And I was asked to review a textbook, mm -hmm. and the author was going on about orientated and orientated, and actually emailed them. His response was, you're from America, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. I've also heard that it's mostly... A, more of a Britishism than an Americanism of English language. It's yeah, just the cultural split, so the language is going in multiple directions as well as moving. Exactly, which is why there's so many millions of words and phrases in the OEE, because it's not just the Britishisms that are in that. Anybody else upstairs while I'm up here? Oh, one right here. Do you have any uh, good resources for grammar and such, for people who don't write a lot? Um, I seem to have a hard time researching that sometimes. Like you just go online and maybe it's you know Grammar Girl or you know Rutgers Edu or it doesn't seem like there are many kind of comprehensive places for beginners. There aren't a lot of comprehensive places that I've seen. That doesn't mean that there aren't any. But I love Grammar Girl. Just getting her, even her online. Um, I think it's once a week or once a day tips. Um, a lot of them I know, but a lot of them I don't. And you can go back on her website and find. Um, answers to questions like that. Otherwise, ask.com works really well, actually, um, if you're able to sift through answers. Um, and otherwise, there are people all over the place who will copy edit for you, who will proofread for you. Some might do it for free. Some might do it really cheaply. Whatever. I bet there's somebody you work with who would love to do it just because they can. That's me. <laughs> Just one quick comment. Um, as the, a former editor of the Oregon State Spelling Championships, I mean, one problem I have with the OED, I know it's revered by many, yes. is that it is very, very inclusive. Yes. And it doesn't give much guidance about in what context words are appropriate. Um, following a grammar or style guide 
that's inclu- you know, or a dictionary or whatever that's inclusive is only useful if the audience you're reading sort of follows it. It's, it, it, it's always about what message you're trying to send. And so, you know, using the word orientated just because it's in the OED probably isn't your best strategy most of the time. <laughs> exactly, which is why I won't use it. And I'll still correct people because I have to. It's actually just kind of another comment or like tip and trick. Um, at the last company I worked at, there was actually something they called the grammar sword mailing list. Oh, and so you could just be like, I'm going to publish this document, send it to this email address, and like you will get an edited you know, document back you know, within a day. You know, it's not like, it's not their jobs, right? right. But it's just like this rogue group of people, very much like yourself. That are, <laughs> I'm um, rogue, yes. So that's, that seems like a really cool like organizational tip, right? Because yeah, like, yeah, there's always people at these jobs doing some other random job that really love this stuff. So. Exactly. Every other job I've had has had copy editing and proofreading and, and actually writing things for people and all of that within it. But I can't put it on my resume because it's not part of my job title. So, yeah. I just have a title to recommend to the gentleman up, up at, in the balcony Excellent. looking for a, a resource. Uh, on Matthew Butterick's book here, you'll see Forward by Brian A. Garner. He wrote a book that I'm shocked, Matthew, you would even allow him to write your forward. It's this thick. <laughs> but it's fabulous. Every question you have about modern American usage, that's the title, by the way, Garner's Modern American Usage. He's written something fabulous in there. So I highly recommend that. Yeah, thank you. I'll look it up, too. One more question. Okay. Oxford comma, yay or nay? Yay. <laughs> yay. That's, that is the Chicago Manual of Style, by the way, not the AP Style Guide. So when I'm doing something that needs AP Style Guide, I have to remember not to do it and groan while I do it. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you.